calls us free. Hallelujah. Yes, Jesus. What a friend we have in him. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, to the Messiah. My God, my God, my God. I want to ask you something. How long has it been since you came to the altar for just him? You know, as much as I travel and go and preach, it's amazing. You can be seated for a moment. Just for a moment. Somebody's thinking, when is he going to preach? Really? <laughs> what people mean sometimes when they think that, because I can feel it, I can hear it, it is when is he going to traditionally do it? Look at your neighbors say, if you ain't shouted at least 35 times by now from the word that's already came forth, you need to catch up. As you travel as much as I do, it's amazing. You give all our calls for things. And people will flood those altars. And what I mean by things is you can announce what God, the thing he's going to do for someone. The thing they need God to do for them. Son, they'll come. Yep. They'll run. Yep. They'll fill the altar up. But when you make an announcement, come for him. Leave all you care somewhere else. Don't even bring them to him right now. Just come for him. Sometimes people stare at you in modern Christian like a deer in the headlight. What's he talking about? Hello? Because prayer has been made just that. It's an approach to God to get something from him. And that's the elementary stage of prayer. According to Romans 10, 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's how it starts. Somebody shouts, you don't think about getting saved and get saved. You don't hear somebody sing about getting saved and get saved. You don't hear even somebody preach about getting saved and get saved. Now, you may get under conviction. Come on, somebody. You may be convinced, but you don't get converted until you actually open your mouth and call on his name. Yeah. Romans 10 said, how can they call on him whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without a preacher? Come on, somebody. So we see it's all linked. It's all tied together. But the whole purpose of preaching is that for somebody to come and call on the Lord. Hallelujah. Somebody say preaching and reaching. Amen. Glory to God. Preaching is to produce reaching. If you just come and say, well, I've heard the preaching and I've heard the teaching, but then you ain't come to the altar and did some reaching. Well, then you've heard the word, though it has been awesome, though it's been powerful, but yet it will profit you nothing because you've not mixed the word of faith. Come on, somebody. You've not mixed it with your own faith because faith without works is dead, James 2, 20. And Hebrews 4 and 1 said the word will profit you nothing when you hear it if you don't mix your faith with it. In other words, in, unless you come and call on God. For example, Isaiah 55, verses 11 said, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It will not return unto me void, but it will accomplish that which I please, prosper into the place where to I send it. A lot of times all we see in that scripture is God sending his word, sending his word. But he said, listen what the Lord said. He said it will not return to me void. Somebody say empty. Yeah. God sends his word to whom he sends it so they might return to sender, that they might bring it back. Come on, somebody, to him in prayer. If God has prophesied to you, if he's given you promises and you're not praying what he's prophesied and you're not praying back to him what he's promised, you will never see it come to pass. If God told you something, he told it to you so you could pray it back to him. Isaiah 65 and 24 said it'll come to pass before they ask, I'll answer. Come on, and while they're yet speaking, I will hear. In other words, God says, before you even ask, I'll answer. That means he's already provided the answer. Yes. But he said, I'll wait to hear you speaking. Right. Come on now. Hello? Come on, so God never meant just for you to hear what he's saying. He, he's saying so you can pray, so you can do some praying. Come on, somebody. He wants you to bring it back to him. 
So after the preaching and after the teaching, if you don't come to the altar and do some reaching, somebody shout, it's all empty, it's all void, it's vain. It's all void. Matthew 21 and 13, Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. But you've made it a den of thieves. Then in verse 14, he called the blind and the lame to him in the temple and he healed them. Don't you know that those that were sick and, and diseased had been in the temple the entire time, but after Jesus walks in with his belt and turns tables over and runs some religious folks out, somebody shout, ever church needs a good bowel movement. Some people, that's why some people don't want a real Jesus in their church, because if he really comes, he'll run some people off. He'll run Jezebels off. He'll run Pharisees out. Come on, somebody. He'll run the religious long snout nose stuck up in the air. If it's a sprinkle, they'd drown the know it all. <laughs> Come on, anybody here, Holy Ghost? And then Jesus made the announcement of why he had such a holy indignation about what was going on in his house. He said, because this is supposed to be a house of praying. He said, but you've made it a den of thieves. In other words, you have stole my power. You have taken my glory. You, you have robbed yourself of me. Because you've neglected the altar. You've abused the altar in not using the altar. Somebody shout, when you're not using the altar, it's in God's eyes the same as abusing the altar. And then after Jesus reinstated, the whole purpose of gathering in his house is to fellowship with him, to pray. Come on, somebody. Then he calls sick folk to himself and he begins to heal them in the temple. Somebody shout, there's a close link to the power of God to heal, to save and deliver to a house of prayer. God ain't it amazing, though preaching is important, he didn't call it a house of preaching. Though worship, in my opinion, is even more important than even the preaching is. He didn't call it a house of worship. Somebody's thinking, why is that? Because Acts 16 and 14, Lydia was a seller of purple. Come on, somebody. But she was also a worshiper of God, and she attended unto the things which were spoken by Paul the apostle. Somebody shout, if we don't know how to worship, we're not going to be able to hear what God's going to say. Come on. Come on. Now, you may be listening, but you won't get it. Come on. Worship opens the heart to hear the word of God and know what it is that's being said. That's why one, a man can sit by another on the same pew, in the same house, hear the same message, and one leave talking about, whoa, glory to God, and the other's thinking, I didn't get nothing out of that. You can go to the bank if you don't put nothing in it. You ride back up there and tell them you want something out of it, they're going to look at you like an idiot. Somebody shout, if you don't make deposits, you sure ain't going to make no withdrawal. The worshiper will hear God. The one that just sits and watches, somebody say, you're a watcher or a worshiper? You're just one that comes to watch or you're one that comes to worship? The one who worships, God's going to say things to you. He's going to show you things that he can't show others. Not that he don't want to, but he can't. So worship prepares the heart of the hearer, amen, to know what it is God is saying. So that's why I say it, even the worship in my point of view, I don't like to use the word opinion, but my point of view that the revelation God's gave me is even more important than hearing the word because there's a lot of word being heard. Come on, somebody. But there's a lot of folks hearing it still ain't getting nothing. Come on, somebody. And the reason is you can't come in this house, sit like a knot on a log. Come on, somebody. Glare and stare. Come on, church. Praise God. Hallelujah. Gaze and grace. Praise God. Praise God, amen, and not worship and thank God's going to talk specifically to you. Right. If you want to hear from God, somebody say worship God. Worship God. Hallelujah. And if you want to hear God, worship God. read God. Amen. His name is called the Word of God. That's Revelation 19 and 13. I just quoted the whole Bible in one scripture. His name is called the Word of God. Yeah. Revelation 19 and 13. Look at your neighbor and say, I can quote the whole Bible. Tell them. And look at him and say, here it is. Here it is. Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> His name's the word of God. Amen. I'm still talking about prayer, though. God gives us his word so we might bring it back to him in prayer. And, and, and his house is a house of prayer. And if we neglect the altar, if we, we don't use the altar, then we abuse the altar. Because the whole purpose of all the praise... The whole reason of all the worship, somebody shout, all this worship tonight is wasted. All this worship 
if we don't come to the altar. Somebody shouted altars at the altar. The other night I was in a service in Homerville, Georgia, and uh, Pastor Tommy Bates was there in, in a camp meeting. It was the second night of it. And during the altar service, people were all in the altars. Hallelujah. And, and, and I looked up on the big screens. It's a big church. And I looked up on the big screens. And, and somebody had spelled altar, A-L-T-E-R. It's supposed to be an A instead of E. But I looked over at my daughter because we was both down there. And I said, that'll work because that's where it alters at. That's where the alterations take place. Alter means to change. The Bible said in Luke 9, verse 29, the Bible said, and when Jesus prayed, his countenance was altered. And his countenance became like a glowing, glittering, amen, image because of the glory of God. Jesus was up on top of the mountain. Somebody shouted, started praying. And his face got changed. Look at your neighbor and say, you spend time with Jesus in prayer, your face will get a work over. Somebody shout, if you spend time with Jesus, your face will get right side up. Because in his presence is fullness of joy and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 16, verses 11. With his countenance, he's made me exceedingly glad. Psalms 21 and verses 6. Somebody shout, it's called a prayer pill. I'm telling you, it's the most wonderful, wonder-working drug, if we could say. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Somebody shout, it'll turn your face right side up. It'll make you smile when everybody else is frowning. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, if you spend time with Jesus, look at him and say, your face will not appear. Come on. Your face will not appear to be a reprint of the book of Lamentations. Hello, God said in his word in Isaiah 56, in verses seven, he said, I made them joyful in my house of prayer. Where did God fill his people with joy? Somebody say in a house of prayer. I promise you, if you spend time with Jesus very long, you may be depressed, you may be oppressed, hallelujah, but God will take the O off of your press and he'll take the D out of your press and the only thing you'll have if you'll pray and press is you'll be impressed. Come on, somebody, hallelujah. He'll press his image into you, he'll press his person into you, he'll press his presence into you and you'll come out looking like him. Yeah. Acting like him. Come on, somebody. Somebody say our joy is connected to his presence. And the only way to know his presence is you got to spend time with him. You got to talk to him. Somebody say you got to use the altar. When Jesus prayed, his countenance was altered. His countenance simply meant his image, his face. Somebody say the way he looked. Look at your neighbor and say, I know you've been needing a makeover. Come on, somebody. Somebody say, he'll change the way you look. You ever met some saints? I wish I had one tonight. You ever met some saints that looks like they, they would need a clothes hanger jabbed up in their mouth to get them to smile? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> they may look like they've been baptized on sewer water and a mixture of lemon juice. <laughs> Come on, anybody here, Holy Ghost? Yes, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. But I promise you, if you'll spend time in his altar, your countenance will be the first thing it alters. He'll change you. Somebody say, that's what he's wanting to do. He's wanting to change us from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord, 2 Corinthians 3, verses 8. But God is all powerful. He can do anything, but he won't do nothing until somebody who's called by his name actually calls on his name. Somebody say, it ain't good enough to be called by his name if you ain't calling on his name. Come on, amen. Second Chronicles 7 and 14 said, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Come on somebody, turn from their wicked ways. Somebody shout, if you're seeking him, you won't stay who you are. Well turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, heal their land. Second Chronicles 7 and 14, everybody wants to point at the pollution in our land. They want to point at politicians. 
They want to point at this one and at that one. But God's pointing at the church. Because the wicked in the what they do does not determine whether the land gets healed. It's what those who say they're called by his name do in an order. I counseled somebody today over social media. It's amazing at the questions I get. And I'm not going to tell you the question. But I counseled them not to compromise but to back away because the fight was not theirs. I said, you ain't been called to change nobody. But the thing you need to do is rest in the Lord again and quit trying to play the role of God, amen, with those people you love and spend time in prayer with them and speak to God more about them than you are trying to convert them speaking to them about God. Sometimes we're speaking to everybody else about God wanting them to change. Come on, somebody, and be converted over. But we don't spend enough of time speaking to God about the person yeah. that we're trying to speak to God about to get them to change. Come on, somebody, look at your neighbor and say, you can't change them, but somebody shot King Jesus can. Come on, somebody. Every person in here that's been born again, born from above, born by the spirit of the living God, you have been born again. You're in the kingdom of God because somewhere, somebody, a mama, a daddy, a grandparent, a, a cousin, an aunt, a friend, a co-worker, some of them may be already in heaven now, but they prayed and that's why you got saved. Somebody shout, that's the only way people are going to get saved. Somebody's going to have to pray for them. If you're trying to preach, for, preach to somebody you ain't even prayed for yet, you need to stop and pray. Because prayer is what makes the difference. It's what makes the change. Come on, somebody. And God says, I'm almighty. I can do anything. All things. But I won't do nothing until... If, he said, that's the condition, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. 